Howdy again everyone, and today I have before you an important and very unusual legacy lens, the Canon FD 35-70mm f4 AF, Canon's very first autofocus camera lens. Canon's old FD mount cameras were not capable of autofocus, except for the specialist T80 model, which is the key reason Canon dumped that entire system back in 1987 in favour of the new EF mount which we all know and love today, but back in 1981 they launched this interesting FD lens with a somewhat ham-fisted workaround. It has its own battery-powered autofocus system built in, using Canon's solid-state triangulation system to accurately focus at the push of a button, well, most of the time anyway. You do not need this lens to even be attached to a camera in order for it to autofocus. What a crazy but awesome idea. It requires two AA batteries, so if you can find a copy of this lens on eBay in good condition, it should still work fine today. It's a full frame lens, only on the old Canon FD mount, so you'll need an adapter for a modern camera, and it has a very basic zoom range, a moderately wide 35mm to a short telephoto 70mm. Not very impressive, but its maximum aperture of f4 throughout the zoom range is a little brighter than the cheapest zoom lenses available. This lens's rather bulky and unusual figure will certainly turn the eyes of any photographer close to you, and it's also a little heavy, especially with batteries inside. It's quite tough, too. It very much looks and feels like one of Canon's bigger L lenses from the era. At the rear, you can see the old FD mount with its mechanical controls. You'll need a Canon FD adapter to get this lens to mount on your modern camera of choice. It includes the aperture control ring. You won't be able to control this lens's aperture from your camera, unless you're using an original FD film camera. On the bottom, there's the zoom control. It works with a little rubberized lever, which doesn't turn very smoothly. And here's the autofocus at work. That confirmation beep can be turned off by means of a big switch at the rear, where there's also a battery check light. The motor works a little slowly, with a clear whirring noise, and there's no option for continuous autofocus. I found the autofocus system to work about 75% of the time with this lens. Sometimes you need to keep pushing the button again and again, especially when shooting indoors or in low light, it didn't like that at all. It's also not very accurate really, but it gets you there in the end. If you want to manually focus, you need to force the focus ring around, which makes you anxious about damaging the focus motor, not good. The lens has a 62mm filter thread, and it does not come with a hood, as that would block the autofocus windows. It won't report EXIF information to your camera, and obviously it does not have its own image stabilisation. Overall, it's a very quirky, antiquated design, and honestly, it's kind of annoying to use out in the field. The autofocus system does work, but just barely. Anyway, let's look at the image quality now. I'll be testing it adapted onto a 45 megapixel Canon EOS R5. At 35mm and f4, the lens is a little soft in the middle of your images with low contrast. Over in the corners, we can still see some detail being captured, but we are also catching a lot of chromatic aberration here. Stop down to f5.6 and the corners sharpen up a little, and the middle of the image looks nice and sharp now, albeit with slightly low contrast still. Here's f8 in the middle, and the corners, and at f11, image quality is still decent, but nothing special. Well, let's zoom all the way into 70mm now. At f4, image quality in the middle is very soft and ghostly. Yes, the lens was correctly focused here, and this was the best image quality I could get. Over in the corners, image quality is still soft, although most of that ghosting has now gone. Stop down to f5.6, and corner image quality is about the same, but the image is clearing up back in the middle, looking acceptably sharp now, but still with low contrast. At f8, there's another marginal improvement, and the corners don't look quite so bad now. Here's f11, and at f16, softness from diffraction begins to creep in. So, if you stop this lens down, then you are able to get acceptable results out of it, but at brighter apertures, not that f4 is a particularly bright aperture, picture quality is really quite weak. 
Let's look at distortion and vignetting now. Your camera won't be able to correct these. At 35mm we see some moderate barrel distortion and pretty dark corners at f4. At f5.6 and f8 they do brighten up. Zoom into 70mm and that distortion flips into a slight pincushion pattern. Again, corners are a little dark at f4, but begin to brighten up at f5.6 and f8. Now, this lens's autofocus motor will only focus as closely as about 1 meter, but if you force the focus ring around, you can get as close as 50 centimeters. At f4, close up image quality is softer than ever. At f5.6 and f8, we get some minuscule improvements, but the close up image quality never really sharpens up. Let's see how the lens works against bright lights, not normally a strong point for legacy lenses. Whether you're zoomed in or zoomed out, we see a lot of purple flaring here when shooting against bright lights. And finally, bokeh. Out of focus backgrounds are not easy to get with this f4 lens, but when you do get them, they're just averagely smooth. Nothing especially beautiful, but also nothing distracting. So there you have it. A certain photography YouTuber tested this lens out a few months ago and got really overexcited about it. Well, I found the lens a bit of a pain to use actually, and its image quality is basically what you'd expect from a 40 year old design, not good. This thing really is more of a museum piece than an enjoyable lens, although I'll never get tired of making it autofocus without being attached to a camera. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, be sure to check out my Patreon page where supporters can get treated to all kinds of exclusive content. Happy shooting!